Right. Well, good afternoon. I hope you have a little bit of coffee. We're going to be going through some of these topics, accessing data from multiple sources, and a little bit of depth. And you see here that I've logged in to my Anaconda Enterprise version 5. So how many of you have an Anaconda Enterprise version 4 or 5 deployed? Great. Just because I'm using the platform here doesn't mean I'm showing you things that are always specific to the platform. The tools that I'm going to demonstrate are actually mostly in the open source. And we're going to use Anaconda Enterprise as our hub to access data from all our sources. So I go out and I teach, and I see a lot of people with really odd setups. Where's your data? How many different sources do you have? Right, so what I'm going to demonstrate here today are things like flat files, CSV files or JSON files that you might have just, say, lying around on a hard drive. Maybe you have them mounted on a shared drive. And we'll take that core concept and start to try to figure out how do we connect and merge that with bigger data sources over on Hadoop or on SQL tables. So I'm going to get my session running here. get my Jupyter Notebook. And so when I go to these sites, the most important thing that we need to know is where is your data and where is your Anaconda Enterprise? And many times people don't always know the answer to these questions. Right? They were told there is some kind of data lake and this Python thing is really kind of cool. And so I tend to, to arrive on site and have to figure out, well, how does this actually work? And so I've seen a lot of approaches, but what really matters is where you put Anaconda. Where is Anaconda Enterprise installed? Or is your desktop with the Anaconda distribution installed in the right network to access your web to access external websites or partner websites, internal websites to your organization? All the flat files you could ever imagine, your databases and your hive tables. And we're going to show each of these kind of examples here in the, in the forthcoming notebooks. And so you can use Anaconda Enterprise as your hub if you put it in the right place. If you can get it close enough to your data so that you're not trying to transfer over slow networks, so that you have it as an edge node in your Spark cluster, and you end up really thinking about wanting to run Anaconda from the Spark side of things, you'll be able to get to all of your data sources and do a lot of really interesting things that maybe you didn't quite think were possible using other tools. So let's take a little tour of the kinds of packages that I'm going to demonstrate today. So all of my notebooks here are going to be running in Python 3.6. Many times you might have a, you know, a, a restriction on this. Many implementations of Spark and Hadoop are going to be pinned to Python 2.7. And so you have to think critically, what version of Python do I have access to? How do I connect to my data? And the reason why this concept of getting to all of my data is so complicated is that there isn't just one thing. Python is not a data science thing. Python is a simple programming language that defines a simple syntax and a few useful classes. We need to connect with other tools, other Python packages in the ecosystem that we've downloaded and installed. And my philosophy, I've adapted here from the, um, the Unix philosophy, is find the one tool that does the thing you want really, really well. If I want to connect to the web, I'm going to go find the best tool I can. And so this is requests. We'll see how to connect to websites and grab data right off the wire. That's all that does. It connects with REST APIs and just receives a string of bytes. That string of bytes might be an HTML file. For that, I use this package called Beautiful Soup. And here I'm using the latest versions of all of these things and just making certain that you see the, the, these package versions that I have here in case some of the content I show is not kind of matching up with versions you might have access to. But things get complicated on really interesting websites 
where you can't just use requests to grab HTML. It needs to be rendered in JavaScript. And so this two packages here, Selenium connects with a headless um, JavaScript web browser called PhantomJS, or it connects to Chrome, or it connects to Firefox to interact with these websites, render the JavaScript, and return for you the final HTML. What we really want to do is work with tabular data. And I consider pandas to be sort of the center of that ecosystem in Python right now. We're going to find ways to get all of our data into a consistent representation using pandas and pandas-derived packages. This is my goal, the way I like to use all of these tools. So I'm using now the latest version of pandas. But to use pandas, I've got to read the data in. I have to fit it in memory, and that can be a challenge. And so the project Dask has developed as extensions to things like lists, NumPy arrays, pandas data frames to provide out-of-core processing and parallel processing and cluster computing using the distributed package. And this is really what we're going to be doing today. We're going to have data in all of our sources. And it may be gigabytes or terabytes in size. I only have small data with me here. But I'm going to use Dask to show you how to think about working with data of extremely large sizes from multiple locations without having to stress this Anaconda Enterprise or big, big, uh, you know, build a really big system with a lot of memory. So things like Dask and Pandas themselves are good at, say, reading flat files, CSV files, Excel sheets, SAS data frames. There's a separate package called SQL Alchemy that does all of the real database translations so that it knows how to think about a MySQL database or a Microsoft SQL database or a Postgres database. So I just have to write simple um, sort of portable SQL queries and let SQL Alchemy perform the connection and do all of the, the interesting things on the back end. And I'm just going to get back a pandas data frame. And then the final package is PySpark. And really, PySpark, although it works with pandas, is a separate sort of line of uh, development. It's not really part of the pandas ecosystem that I was talking about. And there have been some advancements in new packages, things like PyArrow, that I'm going to use to actually go around Spark and connect directly to the Hive table on Hadoop. And I'm actually not going to use Spark. I'm going to try to use Dask and Pandas, sort of, um, what's the word I want to say, piggybacking on top of the Spark cluster that I have to go right to my data source and use the entire Python ecosystem you know, front to back through the entire data set. So these are my packages that I've got ready to go, and that easily maps into the kinds of data that we're going to be working with. So here's my challenge. I want to compute voter turnout in Pennsylvania for the last three general elections. And I've got data everywhere. So this notebook that I have here, you can uh, grab from my Anaconda Cloud account. It's fully rendered with all the output shown in there and all of this example code for how to get to these data sources. And so to begin with, I'm going to try to grab the election results. The election results are here on PA.gov in this, you know, interesting, visually, semi-visually appealing website, but not so easy to just immediately think about working with. Further, if I reload this, it takes some time. This is a JavaScript website. Just trying to snag the uh, HTML data isn't good enough. I need to use a real browser and get the real HTML. Now, I could just sit here in my browser and you know, save as HTML and then bring it into my cluster. I want to do something a little better than that. 
So first, I need to generate these URLs for each of these three general elections. And this is where I'm going to use requests to build my URL for the REST API. Instead of using request.get or request.post, I'm just making a request object to then populate the URL so that I now have a nice function where I give it a year and I get back the full link for the results. That's the first step. I know that this website is written in JavaScript and I won't be able to just grab the HTML. I've got to use a web browser and control the website. So this is where the Selenium web driver and PhantomJS come in, where I need to connect and then get for myself a more interesting object, a soup of HTML tags. So I've got another function to go get a beautiful soup object. And then finally, I can work through that object, find all of the HTML tags that I'm interested in, where my data is. And really the best way to figure out how to work with beautiful soup is just to go right to the website and say, okay, I see where my data is. There's a, a number here, two million votes cast. And so usually every browser in implements something like inspect. And the best thing you can do is go inspect your data, your web access directly. And I can see here then this is a span object. It has a particular class name. It may have a particular ID name. And I visually go through the website I don't need to know a lot about how the website is structured. I don't need to even not know a lot about HTML. If I can find things like class names or ID names just visually here, then I can start working through this soup of HTML tags. And this may be the most time-consuming step of my entire notebook here, is to spend like an hour or so and just try to understand where are my data in the soup. I'll need to get these votes. I'll need to go pick up, say, the name of the candidate. And again, I just go for inspect. It says, okay, I've got something here, items dot candidate name. That looks like something I can search for. And what Beautiful Soup does is provide for me these convenient finding tools, where I say, find me all the tags that have this class name, this ID name, and I just get a nice little Python list. From that Python list, I can just iterate over it, find more child tags, find more attributes, and then start getting the real data. Everything comes in as text, so I eventually have to think about casting to things like integers and floats, but now I can just make simple Python data structures. And if I can make for myself a flat data structure of rows and column-like things, a list of dictionaries, I can easily make that into a pandas data frame. So now I have a pipeline. For every year, I need to run a couple of functions. I need to get the URL, connect with my web browser, get the rendered source, and then process that down to a data frame. And this might take a couple of seconds because it takes a little while to load JavaScript. Now, I was trying really hard to use a special timeout inside Selenium, and the website was just not behaving for me, so I just put a hard timeout. Every time I want to call this function, wait five seconds. And in the end, I get a convenient tabular data structure. There are only 67 counties in Pennsylvania, but I've got, you know, five candidates on the ballot. So this is the kind of data that I'm going to be working with. And I want to take this, really this recipe for getting one table and merge that with all of the registered voter data that I have, which is unfortunately scattered around my data warehouse. But to finish up, let's make a Dask data frame. Dask itself doesn't know how to do access to websites. So I can program it just by taking my regular 
looping algorithm here. And for each of my general elections, I'm going to delay execution of this function. That means I'm just going to create the graph of execution, a delayed uh, recipe. And then later on, I'm going to go compute it, because maybe I've got 100 entries or 1,000 entries, and I can't actually load all the data in at once. But I don't have to change any of my functions. I can just mark them as delayed. And so after a second or so, let's take a look at this. What I get back is a DAS data frame, but I don't see anything because it's not actually gone and retrieved any data. It just created for itself this graph so that it knows that this git soup must accept the output of election URL before it can go and on to the next step. But I can go and grab pieces of this and work with this data frame exactly the same way I work with a pandas data frame. I can look at things like head and tail. And every time I call one of these options, it's going to go try to grab just that portion of the data. It's not going to try to compute all, say, 100 million rows. It's going to go find just the last five. And so now I can just finish up my data wrangling for this portion. I really don't care about the individual candidates. I just want to see the total number of votes cast separately for each year, for each county. And so I can make a little group by, or I could have made a pivot table. But in the end, I'm still not reading all the data in. I'm just creating a pipeline in Dask to specify how to get to all my data. So this is the structure that I want. This is what I want to work with. And then I want to add now more columns for the registered voters each year, each county, and the total population each year in each county. Again, no data has really been read into my enterprise. Data is still out on the web. And so what a DAS data frame really is, is a directed graph specifying my function calls and the data that is output from them in a series. So it's calling election URL three times over three different year inputs. It needs to call get soup and process. And each of these lines can be executed in parallel because they're independent of each other. If I want to just read one year at a time, I, if I have enough cores or I have a nice cluster I can work with and distributed, this is going to happen in parallel. You can imagine that things would get complicated when I want to do a group by. And so the real core of Dask is to, pr is to provide these parallel algorithms that work on chunks, small pandas data frames at a time. And I don't have to think about how to parallelize a group by, how to parallelize a sum. I use Dask for that. And it comes down and gives me the end result. And so at the end here, I've got four chunks of my data that I can work with from now on in parallel as I do the rest of my processing. But again, nothing's been read in. I'm going to take this graph and add more to it. I'm going to say, for every chunk, go and merge with some other data source. But I don't even have to think about chunks. So this is the first step in my process. Now I need to go get more data. But I don't want to go out to the web every time I work with this. Right? Many websites might have some throttling on them. So I'd rather try to save, cache that intermediate result, that group by pivoted like data frame into my local memory on my cluster. We call this persist, the same language that you see in Spark. So now I've got that temporary state ready to go. Every time I want to work with this data frame, I don't need to go back out to the web from scratch. Now this works because I got enough memory to fit all of that. But you may not always have enough memory to persist intermediate states. So now we can go get the rest of my data sets. And I've got the voter registrations 
for each year in different sources. I've got some small data, say an Excel sheet, for the 2016 registered voters. And here I'm just going to use pandas because I can't use DASC. DASC can't figure out how to chunk up an Excel sheet. But that's not going to stop me. So I read my data. It's kind of messy. This could have been a SAS data frame. It could have been a number of other kinds of formats. Anything that pandas can work with. So just as a little reminder, pandas read. Can read from Excel, HTML, Parquet files, JSON files, Feather, and HDF5 formats. And we'll show examples of SQL as well. But the problem with this, this is not really big data, so I don't really need to use my big data tools right now. So I'll do my processing on this to get my data set lined up, homogenized, ready to go to merge it with Dash data frame I made earlier. And it doesn't matter where the source came from or whether I'm using a pandas data frame or a Dash data frame. I'm going to be able to work with all these things together. That's my small data. You may have lots of small data. What I'm going to call medium data is the, two, is the 2008 registered voters. And I've got that on an SQL table. I use SQLite here for demonstration, but it could be MySQL, it could be Oracle, it could be Postgres. The procedure is the same, where I create a connection to that database using SQL Alchemy. And I can use SQL Alchemy to then inspect my database. I can write just string SQL queries and return results. Or I can use the full object relational mapping as part of SQL Alchemy to make Python objects and interact and control my uh, database in an object-oriented fashion. I'm most interested in pandas for right now. And uh, not just pandas, but maybe I've got rather large data sets. So I'm going to use the DASC read SQL table, which means it's going to read a chunk at a time, operate on that, save intermediate results, and grab other chunks. The more cores or the more compute nodes, worker nodes I have in my cluster, the more I can operate um, at once. And again, I'm just doing more pandas, manipulating my column names, changing my data types, adding whatever other columns I need to do without having to think about the database. If I want to add the year so that I know what year this came from when I merge later on, I'm doing that directly in my Dask workflow, my pipeline, rather than trying to save it back into the table on the SQL and read it back in again. So my goal is to, like, one line read from the source and be done with it. Once I've read it in to Pandas or to uh, Dask, I don't really think about the source anymore. I now have a Python object that I can work with. So there's my 2008 results. I'm not limited to tabular data. If I've got the 2012, let's see, ah, if I've got population estimates as a JSON file that maybe I grabbed from some other source or someone gave to me, this is not really flat. For each row, I've got a column, looks like a column called county, but this population estimates is itself a dictionary. I call this a nested data structure. It could nest lists or it could nest dictionaries. And I like to use the Dask read text for this. And it feels a lot like a Spark RDD where I can map and filter and reduce. So this is a JSON file. JSON to me really means dictionaries. And so the, the JSON load S is going to convert that raw text to Python dictionaries. And it doesn't matter that I'm using Dask or that it's you know, rather big data or that I'm reading 1,000 files at once. I can now work through every row, write simple Python functions 
that manipulate these dictionaries. And so I want to flatten this thing so that I have separate columns for each year in my population estimates. And again, I just take my function, I map it over my data. Once I get it flat, I have a quick, easy pipeline to make a Dask data frame. So now I've got the final piece of that representation. But it's still not quite right. I can continue to do pandas, data frame-like operations, like melting the column names down to values. I really want a long data frame instead of a wide data frame. And so I can melt down those column headers into the rows. So, so far, I've gotten my small data from Excel sheets or from SAS, my medium data from SQL, but it could also be big data depending on the kind of SQL table you've got. And I read some unstructured data, which again could be small, medium, or large. By using Dask, I've got a great way to be able to access chunks at a time to be able to do out-of-core parallel processing. And so the final step, and sometimes the most complicated step to think about, is the true big data in your hive tables. And to do this, I'm going to leverage a little bit of Spark, but I'm really going to try not to use it that much. And so what's important here is that I've connected and I'm running this notebook inside my Spark cluster or on the edge of my Spark cluster so that I can get a context. Many times in your organization, this might come in for free. You may not have to think too much about how to get your Spark context. But as long as you're within your Spark cluster, you'll be able to connect to it from Python. And I've preloaded a Hive table for the 2012 voter registration. I can get that from my catalog. Sometimes it takes a little while. And so I've got now my persistent Hive table. And I can continue to use Spark to go grab pieces of my data. All right, I can show the results here, or I could uh, say perform a query. I could say um, Spark SQL select star from uh, PA voters 2012 limit five. But what this really gives me is a Python-like object called a data frame. It's not a pandas data frame. No data has been read in until I ask it to do something special. So I could say take my result and convert it to pandas. And that sounds like a pretty good thing to do, except that, remember, pandas is a small data. It has a limitation on the amount of memory. So your edge node would have to be rather big if I wanted to really process a big data table. So pandas and Spark, right, we have this hole now. I've got all my other data sets in my nice Dask data frames. But I've got this barrier now to Spark. And what I want to show is, kind of getting around that, because a Hive table is not really SQL. There's no real relational database back there. It's just a Hadoop file. And in this case, they're Parquet files. And I can easily work with my Spark catalog to get my database. You may be using the default database or some other specially pre-made database. And I can go find out where on, say, the Hadoop file system this, this Parquet file lives. And so this little function here is just telling me, oh, I know where to find those Parquet files. And I should be able to see in that directory that they're just something dot Parquet. This file has been chunked up into four pieces. And I should then be able to read those four pieces in parallel, 
out of core with Dask. So the package that I talked about earlier called PyArrow is helping us sort of bridge the gap between our, our Hadoop and our Hive all the way down to Dask and Python. So that I can now just use Dask to read the Parquet file. I get back my Dask data frame that I can continue to do real pandas API things. And there's my the, the first five rows of my 2012 registered data. So now I've got a pathway of getting to my real big data systems, and I don't really have to use Spark. So I've got a bunch of pieces. I've got my web data, which was the all election results from the three years. Separately, I've got voter uh, registration for 2008, 12, 16, and then one more DAS data frame of population estimates. Because they're all DAS data frames, I can continue to compose these pipelines, do a little bit of, say, homogenation on these things because they all have the same API, concatenate the registered data, and then start to merge that. I want to merge the registered data into my county election results and then merge the population into that, and I get now my big data frame. And it's pretty easy to figure out that this is probably a really big data frame. I can't get it all into memory. I've created this graph of delayed execution. And now we're ready to finalize our results, where I want to group by the year, compute the fraction of voters who cast votes. And the final step in DASK is to compute the result. So I'll compute the real turnout, which, ve which is somewhere around 70% and I'll separately compute the fraction of registered voters to the population, which is again around 70%. And so what I've really done here by using Dask is create this much more complex looking execution graph. And we'll give that a second to render. Where you read these things from the bottom up. So there's my three election results. There's some other data sources, and each one of these parallel lines can execute independently. And then everything gets aggregated up together in a number of group buys or pivots down to the final result, so that I only bring back that final result in this compute, which is just a pandas data frame. That pandas data frame is now in memory on my uh, Anaconda Enterprise node here, my edge node. That's where I have Matplotlib installed. That's where I have Bokeh or Data Shader installed. That's where I do my visualizations. Maybe if I get it small enough and I would rather use scikit-learn than mllib, you can use a package called DaskML to coordinate more big data learning. So this is all of the, most of, I think most of the kinds of data sets that I've seen out in the wild. But if you've got something that's missing, the best thing you can do is a little Google search and find that one package that does what you want to do really well. And the better packages for the example that I've shown here are going to work natively with Dask or Pandas. If it works with Pandas, you can coerce it into Dask reading things a chunk at a time. All right, so you'll be able to download this notebook. You can view it on my Anaconda Cloud account. I'll give you a second to, to write that down or take a picture of it. And these are going to give you, you know, good sort of example cases for how do I utilize all these tools together. Because each of these tools Requests, Beautiful Soup, Pandas, Dask, SQL Alchemy are written by different developers. The only possible hope of coordinating efforts is that I've decided to standardize a little bit on Dask data frames. And the good thing is these things just use Python, which is a natural and really uh, useful glue language between all these kinds of components. So, 
we're doing all of this demonstration here on the platform. So it'd be really nice to think about how do I let other people in my team make use of this kind of processing. Apart from just you know sharing my notebook, because we're all on the same platform, we can do all of the access restrictions that we want and share our projects, share our, our notebooks. But I want to try to do something a little bit better. I want to have the ability for people to actually import my code, grab my data, and work with it. So the final topic, I want to introduce some concepts to sort of run with. There'll be some other talks so I'm going to recommend that you, you visit. So here's my code. I really would like to let someone else easily reuse this in a very Python-like way. And the most Python way of reusing code is to import it. I want them to be able to install this little recipe for getting to that SQL table. And I want to be able to make changes and have everybody keep up to date with w either the way I change my code or whether the background data, f uh, data changes. So what I'm going to do is make a conda package for that. Conda packages are good for just about anything that you want to deploy that can be versioned. And the good thing about Conda packages is I can declare dependent packages. This thing needs SQL Alchemy. It needs Dask. And so the person who wants to use my code doesn't really need to think about that. They should be able to just install my pipeline and use it. And we already know that Conda packages are easy to update and install. You can make separate environments and keep track of different versions. So we have our little code there in our notebook, but we need a few more pieces. We've got to maybe transform it a little bit so that it can be imported without any side effects as a simple function. I'm going to further write a couple of validation tests that the user could run so that you know, we can kind of keep track and maybe they can file an issue to say, hey, this test failed. Maybe there's something wrong with the, the data or there's something wrong with the process. And along the way, we're going to need two other important files. We're going to need a setup tools, setup PY, the most minimal setup PY I can imagine, along with the most minimal conda build recipe. And if you want to learn more about conda and conda build, I recommend going to the deep dive tomorrow. So I'm going to show you just my little example here that I've got on GitHub. for this registered 2018 registered voter data. I'll give you a second to take a snapshot, and I'll put it back up again later. So this little project here is going to have a nice example of a Python package with all the setup tools that you need in the Conda recipe, along with that little SQLite file. So you can actually run this and practice with it. So I'll give you a little tour of this project. And I've got it loaded up in my VS code here. Let's make the font a little bigger. So a little, little readme here is just kind of very minimal, where I'm really defining two functions in this API. I'm defining a read function, which is going to return for you that Dask data frame. And I'm going to define a test function that you can run to validate your code. And you want to be careful with some of these validation functions. Uh, I'm doing a very minimal validation that the column names are correct and that the D types are correct, whether it's an integer or a float or a string. But I'm not counting the number of rows. That could be a very expensive operation, because this may be really big data. And so you get to choose sort of what level of complexity do you want these tests to run. Or maybe you implement a fast test and a slow test, something that you'd run as the developer of this and something you would recommend that the users run. And so out here in the top directory, I've got my setup py, which really does nothing important except define a name. And I'm using a, a separate helper script to go find the version number that I'd rather store 
along with my code. So the real meat of a Python package is in the second, the first inner directory. And usually you give these things the same name. The package name is registered 2008, and so the subdirectory of that is also registered 2008. And so in here, I just define the minimal amount of code I need. This py file called main is the, the real data pipeline. Connects to the SQLite, returns a DAS data frame. I could have implemented any amount of complexity I wanted. I could have added some keyword arguments and done some different things, maybe changing, say, the representation or choosing what columns to grab. And then I define a little execution script with this name equals main. This is the stuff that doesn't happen when you import. My test, using unit test classes, is just verifying using the pandas testing APIs that the county column is a string, the year column is an integer, and I'm expecting the total votes column to be a float. Something doesn't look right, we'll come back to that. Then I define a couple of simple test functions. And the final trick to compose all of this into something easily importable and usable is with the init py file, where I just want to make sure that the read function is imported from the local main.py file. And here I define a test. Unit test is not really designed to work programmatically in Python like that. They really like you to run it on the command line, so it takes a little bit of boilerplate to go pick up that test structure class that defined those two functions I was using, and then a couple of lines just to make sure that it runs correctly. So these are my, this is my API that I define here in the init py, the read and the test. And the final step is the actual conda build recipe itself where I grab the version from the init.py file, and I declare what packages I need to run this. So anytime someone tries to install this package, it will force an install of SQL Alchemy and force an install of Dask. Further, I could go on and say, well, I really would prefer that this is greater than Dask 0.16, because I know it doesn't work on earlier versions. And you'll learn more about these kinds of things at the con deep dive. And that is what I call sort of the minimal amount of work to make a conda package. And you can put any of your Python code in a conda package. The final step is to go run the conda build and maybe share that package up on your repository so that somebody else on the on your um, Anaconda Enterprise, say we'll source activate new env. If they want to reuse your pipeline, they just need to conda install registered 2008. I'm going to grab it from my local package directory here, and I've already installed all the required packages I need, so I'm just going to grab that one package. And then if me as the developer, I upload a new version 0.2, everybody else can go conda update to the latest version. So now I've got a way to reuse that pipeline, say in IPython. I can be import the registered 2008. I get a data frame with read. It's that Dask data frame. Nothing's been actually read in or computed so far. It's just that delayed graph. And finally, run my test to make sure that everything looks OK with the test function. And actually, as I said, something's wrong. This function failed and said, oh, that D type for that column is wrong. So I can use the conda package and the Python packages to put all of this kind of complexity in and think about sharing my pipelines in interesting ways.
right? So that's my story. We've seen accessing data from every possible source, maybe not every possible source, but the most common sources that you might find out in the wild. And thinking ahead a little bit about how we might compose a pipeline and share that pipeline with other users on Anaconda Enterprise. So with that, I'll, it's the end of my presentation. We'll have some time for questions.